Sengi Ti, good evening. Welcome to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Art Film Archive Contemporary Indigenous Art Showcase. Arts and Design Monday is organized and sponsored by UC Berkeley's Arts and Design Initiative. The series is co-curated by the Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium at the Berkeley Center for New Media, the Department for Art, excuse me, the Department of Art Practice, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, the Digital Humanities at Berkeley, the Arts Research Center, the Graduate School of Journalism, and the Richmond Arts and Culture Commission. Featured this evening in the Contemporary Indigenous Art Showcase and headlining the event is a look, a look, a luctic, a luctic artist and choreographer, Tanya Lunkin, Lunk, Lunkin Lunkletter. Tanya will read from her book, Slow, Slow Scrape, accompanied by video works and performing doc, performance documentation. Uh, we will then have Northern Chumash visual artist, Sarah Biscara Dilly. Dilly is a graduate in Native American Studies at UC Davis. She will discuss the ways native language grounds her own visual and written practice, which is central to her tribal's community work asserting creative, intellectual, and embodied sovereignty. We are followed by Afro-Indigenous poet and UC Berkeley graduate student, Alan Pelez Lopez. Alan will perform excerpts from their latest project, Liwelas Champal Champales, a choreo poem written in Spanglish that tells the story of settler colonialism through the voice of an unnamed toddler, a medicine woman, a grandma, and five dragonflies. In closing this evening, will be Nez Perce writer and scholar, associate professor of Native American studies, UC Berkeley's Professor Beth Piato. Beth will read from her forthcoming collection, The Beadworkers Stories, and reflect on the relationship of beadwork, storytelling, and indigenous language in contemporary Native life. I'm happy to serve as the uh, introducting voice this, morning, uh, this evening. My name is Patrick Naranjo. I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo, and I am the new director for UC Berkeley's American Indian Graduate Program. Um, within our communities, within our native communities, Tundi, or languages, play a crucial role in the daily lives of people, not only as a tool for communication, education, social integration, and development, but also as a repository for each person's unique identity, cultural history, traditions, and memory. Despite their immense value, many languages around the world continue to disappear in alarming rates. That is why this year, the United Nations has declared 2019 as the Year of Indigenous Languages in efforts to raise awareness to these languages, not only for the people who speak them, but for others to appreciate the contribution they make to our world's rich cultural diversity. We need to take a moment to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin the ancestral and unceded land of the Chechenyo Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Tonight's Contemporary Indigenous Showcase also marks the celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day worldwide. Uh, this is a global effort to revisit the misled colonial narrative and share our Indigenous languages in honor of our contemporary existence. Uh, this also serves as the 50th anniversary of the November 20th, 1969 Alcatraz occupation, an effort of protest intended to bring attention to the current situation of Indigenous peoples here in the United States and an effort in which UC Berkeley alumni also participated within. Um, to begin this evening, uh, I would like to ask everyone to rise and remove your hats uh, for an opening uh, Tewa prayer. Um, the significance of starting the event this evening with the prayer is to acknowledge the opportunity for each one of us to be in this setting uh, and for each one of us to put our hearts together, our minds together, for the intention of a good evening and to also recognize the space that we occupy right now. Mbiagindi, Posejemuri Hegetna, Navi Pomberinghu, Pinta Giri, Honta Giri, Nambiwawati Agin, Ehui, Nei, Berkeley Matuin, 
kunda wo ha poiki bo sengo kui wo yombe thank you now to begin this uh the event this evening we will have tanya looking link later thank you Um, I'm grateful and honored to be speaking here, uh, to be here with all of you um, in Huchin Ohlone land and with the Ohlone people of this place and also uh, the indigenous peoples who live here today as well uh, on Indigenous Peoples Day. And I'm going to read from my forthcoming collection of poetry, Slow Scrape. How do we traverse the slow scrape of time. In memoriam, unspokenness, part one. In a place where words do not exist, no words pass through my trunk, dissolve, silence. 500 I call by tender names, guts caught in their throats, gasping and grasping they fall, heaped into earth, supple silence. 500 nestled within knife sharp slate and a mick of sea otter, salt spray and cannon ash, relentless swell and musket strike. In no place soundlessness passes through my limbs lips, belly, until tips of fingers, outline of spine, surrender to a parcel heaped with 500 tender shoots pulled apart, edges of refuge rock soaked in unspokenness. Part two. Esh duwak, esh kashluni, ni chig Ni chugni luku, tange luku, tengluni. I hear the sound a long way off, scattered. I can't say I know the sound or what it is meant to be. At first, just the sensation, gentle. I reach with my ear. She whispers. She calls, calls ashduak until I recall a voice, a language I do not know, heaped on this patch of languageless land, until I hear a voice pure static, eshkahluni, water laps, relentless at stones. I sip, then gulp, tongue to salt ether, nose to damp black earth. Ni chignuluku, I hear wings before a call, my neck bone extends to see a path above as I remember bird silhouette. The sound of a voice rains vibration. A thousand wings, 500 birds, above jagged moss encapsulated slate rock, sets, 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 swell, sets, 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 sets neck, sets bone, sets, 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 sets rock, sets, 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 sets gut, sets, sets, sets amek, sets, 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 tange luku, water swells, crushing rock. She calls, and in this calling, she catches the throat, she hooks the gut, relentless, tengluni. Uh, 
this work refers to a dark period in Alutic history during imperial rule with Russian fur traders' violent management of Alutit and our lands, as well as an event, Refuge Rock, which broke Alutic resistance to enslavement. Our people continue to deal with the effects of intergenerational grief resulting from this event and this period of time. And on Alutic translation, um, I composed this poem referencing the Alutic Dictionary, a conversational dictionary of Kodiak Alutic, compiled by Jeff Lear, published by the Alaska Native Language Center at University of Alaska Fairbanks in 1978. I have not included translation of Alutic in past publication and exhibition of this text as I maintain that indigenous languages do not require translation for the reader. And in this way, I gesture towards my complex relationship to Alutic, my mother tongue. Shuk, a human being, a Fognac dialect, the S is pronounced shh. It sounds like shuk but with a shorter O. Perhaps we shake, or past tense, we shook. When are we shaken? An event score for indigenous epistemologies, Eber Hampton. A person enters and reads. The audience listens, but does not look. Then the audience looks only to follow with its body. Then the audience's body turns to the east. Then the audience holds its heart. Then the audience listens, but does not look. An event score for haunting, Eve Tuck. A person enters and reads, the audience remembers relentlessly. Then the audience feels no ease. Then what can decolonization mean other than the return of stolen land? Then what must it feel like to be haunted? An event score for the epistemic violence of translation, Edgar Heap of Birds. One, a person enters and speaks in Alutic. Two, a person enters and speaks in Alutic. The audience listens. An event score for a Fognac Alutit one to three, abridged. An Alutic person enters and says, our memory marks a Fognac, a Fognac marks us. What are we tethered to? What holds us together? When I am home on our island, I sense that the land exudes grief, this feeling. Many of us have left the land of our ancestors, perhaps because the grief becomes unbearable. Shuk, a human being. A Fognac dialect, the S is pronounced shh. It sounds like shuk, but with a shorter O. Perhaps we shake, or past tense, we shook. When are we shaken? So I'm going to read um, from another series of poems. Um, and just so you're aware, these video works were not created um, alongside these texts. Uh, they were created for specific, specific works, uh, spe specific exhibitions, and they have their own specific histories and research and investigation. But what I also really love about them is that they are open in a sense. And so when I show the works and I read the texts, um, perhaps there are connections between the two that you make as a listener or as a viewer. So the next poems I'm gonna read are called 44 Days and The Harvest Sturdies. And they were written in the winter of 2012, 2013, in response to Chief True Suspense's hunger strike, a 44-day action that began December 11th, 2012. And she fasted for treaty in a teepee on Victoria Island in the Ottawa River, not far from Parliament Hill, Ottawa, Canada. So I, I live in Canada. I've lived um, in Anishinaabek territory for 
10 years, and pr prior to that, I lived in, um, and, and that's within the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 in Nipissing First Nation Territory. Prior to that, I lived in Treaty 6 um, in Cree, Cree and Soto Territory um, for 10 years as well. And so while I come from the native villages of Athognak and Port Lyons in southwestern Alaska, uh, Kodiak Island, and I'm a Lutik or Shukbiak, um, I've spent uh, a long time living in Canada and certainly thinking about the context, the political, social, cultural context um, that has come about uh, in the 20 years that I've, I've lived there. So I, I kept thinking about these myths that Chief Spence wore in many of her press engagements um, because they are a symbol um, often for James Bay Cree people. And she's from Ottawa Piscat First Nation and she's James Bay Cree. Um, and my spouse and my children are James Bay Cree also um, from Moose Cree First Nation. And so for this series of works, I interviewed um, relatives, uh, Agnes Hunter, uh, Marlene Kapashisit and Lillian um, uh, Trapper during January and February of 2013 regarding the process for making traditional James Bay mitts. And so in these series of works, um, I'm thinking about women's work and about treaty and about the land. And these have been uh, not, not only published, but also um, shown in exhibition and are a part of a larger kind of ongoing investigation that I've done uh, over several years. So on Cree translation, Agnes Hunter from Pewanik um, and Duane Linklater provided spelling and translation of Cree words in the Harvest Sturdies. And I was thinking about the way in which the reader encounters Cree language um, privileging Indigenous language as a way to enter or to be refused access to Indigenous thinking. Indigenous peoples continue to work to recover Indigenous languages as a result of colonial projects such as Indian residential schools, the, the legacy of Indian residential schools, a system that actively worked to dismantle Indigenous languages, families, and our relationships to the land. Indigenous peoples have historically experienced a range of emotions in relation to English language. At the very least, we can describe this experience as discomfort and not knowing, particularly for the children who entered Indian residential school, sometimes at the ages of three or four, and would stay for sometimes um, until they were 16 or 17 um, and were away from their, their, ha their homes and their families. Um, I just came from uh, a forum at uh, Algoma University, or uh, which is on the site of Shingwak, uh, which is a former Indian residential school, and, and had the opportunity to listen to a number of uh, Indian residential school survivors um, and elders speak about their experiences at different sites within the school, including the chapel that was built by children, um, the archives, and uh, the cemetery. So. Um, I continue to kind of process uh, what they shared with me. And uh, if you don't know about this history, uh, please uh, investigate it. Maybe look up the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission of Canada's uh, report, final report, and their 96 calls to action uh, that were published in 2015. So in this um, text, I cite Cree speakers uh, who are intergenerational language learners and teachers that I'm in relation to. 44 days. At 21 days, on the eve of the new year, on unmelted river, I watch until night, fearful of what might come. 44 days. She relents, stays with us, she is not spent, she continues. Now that number and she know one another. The Harvest Sturdies. Cheap memory foam cushions a cheaper mattress. Under goose down comforter and flannel, I'm wrapped, composing before I open my eyes. There's a woman whose name means to harvest, to provide. A crimson ribbon skirt to ground, a down coat, tanned moose hide mitts braided with yarn rest at her sides, held at her neck. 
Moose hides smoked and tanned collide with red and white beads. Those hands pluck geese, chop wood, snare rabbits, stoke fires, lay spruce boughs for warmth, the harvest sturdies. Here, I bleach black mold lines on window frames, scrub the septic tank toilet, wash, rewash bathroom countertops. He pine saws the floors, stacks rugs on deck snow. Together we dust, scrub, bleach to prepare our home for visitors. From a hand-me-down couch through the window, an ice fishing hut appears driven by a truck I can't see. It hovers on dirt road to launch onto the frozen lake. This view from our 900 square foot home on someone else's First Nation. Surrounded by blankets hanging, hanging inside raw canvas and scraped trees, spruce boughs on ground to insulate, she rests. A wood stove pipe creaks towards December sun. The girls crouch on unthawed land near a fire. She sits mantled in blankets against wintry damp. She listens as they speak about a day when every child in Canada feels they are worth something. I watch as she brings her lips to each cheek and brow, and I plot a line for her as these James Bay Cree mitts rest at her neck. To harvest, provide, dispense, she enters her 21st day, the eve of a new year on the unmelted river. Mitts, astasak, women, iskwewak. James Bay Astasak worked by women's hands, Astasak. And from the life of an animal, you say it's a year to fix a moose hide or longer. Your hands clip, scrape, wring, stretch, wash, tan, smoke. Your hands work hides, birds, fur, beads, fur linings, stitches, thread, cloth. Both your hands work these objects that aren't objects. Astasak warm the hands of Wasasak. Napewak, Isquiwak, on this land, Astasak. Women who work in this way, mothers, grandmothers, aunties, I'm telling you, I don't know this work. Nimbly, James Bay Isquiwak craft Astasak. Swiftly, they sew Astasak. Astasak in repetition, they stitch. Swift repetition, they clothe their families. Nokum. I call you, ask about sewing mitts. Instead, you tell me you grew up in a teepee on the land, in the bush near Hudson Bay, 95, 200 miles from Piwanak. Your dad hunted caribou, trapped beaver, otter, mink, and nowadays, the young men trap martens. Years ago, in my mother-in-law's kitchen, you fried caribou with onions, ruddy on a spring afternoon in Timmins. After tea and visits in your daughter's house, I told you my grandmother passed away. I was only seven. I can be your grandmother, you said. Now, as we talk on the phone, you and Piwanak, me on Lake Nipissing, I wonder why I never asked you more. I waited so long. Nearly 80 this May, and you can't cook in the teepee, nor teach the kids how to snare or to speak Cree, but you so fierce and scrub the floors from your wheelchair. They need to understand the whole concept of our craftsman, Auntie. So it's done like this. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread. Astasak, maskasina. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread. Petal, leaf, stem, yellow, purple, green, daughter and son and daughter. Petal, leaf, stem, yellow, purple, green. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread. Astasak, maskasina. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem. Seam, thread, needle, hem, seam, thread. Instead, with accent hues of moss and lavender shades of rose, I follow a map of syllabics. I write on Etikowayan, 
and build my lines like this. No kom nanek iskwewak 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 aski 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 aski. When it's my own time, my own sewing, my own ways, it's like I go into a little place of my own, ante. That's Ivani Abinmalo. She's a Maliseet uh, dancer. She dances both powwow and contemporary, and she's one of the really beautiful um, dancers that I have an opportunity to work with in my practice. Practice, 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 practice. A stitch, a bead, another stitch, repeat. A stitch, a bead, another stitch, repeat. A stitch, a bead, another stitch, repeat. A bead, a stitch, another stitch, repeat. A stitch, a bead, another stitch, repeat. Hands deft, every stitch straight, each bead nimble, repeat. Hands deft, every stitch straight. Each bead nimble, repeat. Hands deft, every stitch straight. Each bead nimble, repeat. Hands gentle, gentle, very gentle, repeat. Gentle, gentle, very gentle, repeat. Gentle, gentle, very. You connect with your loved ones. For me, I connect with my mom. It's my mom and grandma, mostly my mom, though, and my aunties. I have their patterns, their mitts, their slippers. I pull them out. I look at them. I see her writing. I can see the style of my aunts. I can see the style of my mom. And these papers are little whittled now. They're just thinning out. You start thinking about them. It's healing. It brings real comfort in your soul when you're sewing. I get a lot of comfort. That's why when things go on, ah, I'm going to go do some sewing, I go in another world. It's hard to explain just with you and God. You're thinking, you're praying, your mind goes, you're in another atmosphere. Auntie. I don't let it go. I won't let it go. Smoke of the canvas skirt you bind on a tikawayan in the cook teepee eddies. We spark the spongy wood for this last part. You show me over the phone, Nukum. Raising one delicate bead from the cache, I fire the caribou broom. Turn it over in my mind as I cannot see its texture, weight, color, the light. You say, only three or four left in Piwanic and perhaps two in Fort Severn know how to fix the hide of a tick. Nukum, I am not with you. Nukum. Her hands that cradle caribou hide, sinew, all manner of beads, fur. My hands crouch inside the space she presses between her fingers, inside the space resting at her palms. Do you remember when you asked me to be your grandmother? I bend at the waist, wrap my arms around her shoulders, resting against the wheelchair. Yes, my sound to her ear. So I keep checking the time because this is the first time I've ever read uh, from, the, from my forthcoming collection of poetry as my forthcoming collection of poetry. And so I know I have 30 minutes and I'm trying to be right on time um, and to leave time and space for all the other folks who are here as well this evening who are gonna share with you their writing. So this last piece that I'm going to share with you is called Decommission. Um, And I think I wrote it in 2013. Three men stand facing an open U-Haul. The carcass of our Jeep tucked inside is a thousand pounds. His black boots mark the white ground. 
At his back, a wind carves deep water. For four years, Phil has tended to the Jeep. Sometimes it is driven 10 minutes down the dirt road to his garage. Other times it is towed billowing white smoke to wait its turn for repair. Together we listen to the hum grow more deafening, feel the catch, cough, and sputter. Phil and his garage sit squarely on Nipissing First Nation. We live down the road in a small house. Daily we pass his house, drive to town, and for four years, the Jeep has carried us across the invisible boundary between Nipissing First Nation and the city of North Bay. He tells Phil his idea, and for a year, Phil listens. He doesn't say much. He calls in town to find someone to tear the blue down to its frame, but it isn't right. Each man he speaks to makes him think of Phil and wait for his decision. He waits. Two summers ago, we drove 10 hours, thousands of kilometers south, in the refuge of the cool Jeep to the unforgivable stickiness of upstate New York. He told someone in that place of compost and art and heat and dorms the Jeep, that the Jeep was his horse. I see the Crow Fair, Montana. When we were young, we camped in the tall grass. He braided my hair while crow boys rode horses through camp with reins, but no blankets. The 10 a.m. parade each day called me. Horses in stitched beadwork, exquisite. Shiny trucks with elders and families in the back. Truck beds wore Pendleton blankets. Hoods were adorned in beads, a procession. I see the time I traversed mountain ranges and plains, whisking three children to Oregon, how cheap the gas was, how Oregon beaches interrupted, how the Columbia River, how tulips. There are other stories. When he tells me his idea, it lives in my imagination for a year or more. I turn a sculpture over in my mind. An object transforms from the utilitarian to the non-useful, quotidian to non-everyday. I picture the sculpture sandblasted. As it is torn down in my mind's eye, as it is decommissioned in his imagination, Phil, too, deconstructs the Jeep. First, in his head, I hold my breath. His intention is for Phil to tend to the Jeep one final time, to tend to the ideas of object, invisible boundaries, and the time it takes to build relationships. We wait for his decision. For four days, the Jeep is pulled apart and boiled down. For four days, Phil labors. It sits tucked inside the U-Haul as a rusted carcass. I catch a glimpse and no longer remember all that I wanted to say about living with this object for six years. My ideas about the object are not the same as the object itself. My ideas are only part of the negotiation between these men and the thousand pounds left. So I might just say something briefly about this particular work, um, uh, the video work. Um, this video is called Slay All Day. It was a commission for uh, the opening of the Remy Modern in Saskatoon. And uh, the dancer is Kynwin Gobert, who I've worked with since 2013. And uh, we had originally worked together on uh, the first section of choreography uh, for a project that was in response to um, the documentary Nanook of the North uh, by Robert Flaherty, um, which is considered to be you know, the first documentary film um, and is very, very problematic in its depiction of Inuit people. Um, and so I was responding to that by investigating Alaska Native um, and Inuit athletics um, these incredibly beautiful and powerful uh, movement forms, uh, but working from uh, the perspective of kind of breaking them down and kind of putting them back together. And so um, in the first section, uh, we worked through um, what's called the seal hop or the knuckle, knuckle hop and some other forms as well. Um, these movement forms were often used uh, in to prepare the body for subsistence hunting and fishing um, and are continue today. So you can go to um, these competitions in Alaska and in Canada and in other sort of Arctic and subarctic countries in the world. Um, I thought it was a really good departure 
for the making of um, and response to that particular film. But later when I revisited the choreography for this particular video, I was less interested in Nanook of the North and more interested in uh, the body as a form and particularly how strong uh, a woman's body can be. I kind of took you through a long journey. I hope that uh, you were able to follow me through all of those different works. Um, many of my works are quite short, and so it's like a tiny um, tincture. Uh, so I just want to say Koyana Shanique, and uh, thank you so much. Wachilhini, Wawaimea, Wasitakawa. Tia Patakasla, Wachia Patiaana, where are you from and where are you going? Strange weaving of wood, cattle, iron, oil, fat, or fur. Imagined a world in pieces. Ta Kilismu, fat, ranches, missions, candles, cattle. Where we dipped candles for forced prayer, they gave us new names. Often referred to as obispeño chumash, we are baptized with words again and again, an attempted transfiguration of the complex and layered relationships that make up Yaktichu Tichu, the people, into the perimeter of a mission, an asistencia, or a ranch. Mission documents used as legible forms of verification for recognition, but also as the source of an unstable identity decide our presence or absence in the eyes of the settler state. Without accounting for the complexity of our experiences or the inherent contradiction of requiring existence to be verified by the same mechanisms that dispersed and displaced us. Written into words and maps that remain fixed despite the life in all things, the systemic disordering of our worlds has been suspended across generations, attempting to make such, dis uh, such violence a new creation story. But our self-determined identities have the exponential capacity to exist beyond the codified, grounded within our own realities as indigenous peoples and speaking from our respective centers of the world. While settlers imagine their possession, indigenous peoples simultaneously deepen our connections, navigating narrative and physical confinement by maintaining long-standing relationships and challenging generational tensions to maintain survival. Though plot maps display the world in flat, quantified dimension, it is our stories and relations that awaken the images and texts that imagine the disparate, a world in pieces. Our world is one of expansive whole, citing rivers and places with perspective in a language of family, of cultural values, of inspired determination. Elizabeth, Louise, Marie, Louise, Unasia, Lizzie, Mary, Maria Luisa, Leonora, Lorenza. Our cascade of names has always held multiple meaning, marking relation and continuum in place, a recipe, a middle name, the margin of a certificate of birth, an argument between new parents. Like our continuance, our titled land came to be through relationship, only possible through my grandmother Luisa, 
uh, the Kanaka Maoli daughter of uh, Joaquin Armas, the son of unbaptized people from Veracruz, born at Mission San Diego and coming of age at, at San Carlos Borromeo near Monterey. Like many other displaced, dispossessed, and diasporic peoples bound up in the mission system and its subsequent enclosure of the land, Armas became a renowned horseman, working in the 1830s and 1840s for Kamehameha III, herding feral longhorns long into makeshift corrals along the slopes of holy mountains and the valleys of West Maui. Her father, as imbricated in the colonial industry as he is, represents the indigenous practices of vaquero and then, and then emergent paniolo traditions, a quickening movement between California and Hawaii, a symbol of both innovation and fracture. It reflects connections existing long before colonial imposition, but also the dire choices indigenous peoples have had to make to ensure survival, including those that further distance us from who we are our responsibilities not only to our own land, waters, and lifeways, but respect for those of other indigenous peoples. What do you call a moment that never stopped? An endless stretch of changing realities. Place is in each of us. Each scene is unending, a point of occurrence implied, but unsuccessful. El Camino Real, the royal road, an eminent domain. Spu. Earth, land, mountain, world, unratified treaties, homelands, and privatization. In California, the transition between nations driving occupation disrupted many adapted lifeways and patterns of survival. 18 treaties were negotiated with assumed representatives from less than half of California tribes after the inception of statehood in 1850, most of which promised large tracts of land. 8.5 million acres in total in exchange for seeding land bases that ran from the edge of the Great Basin to the sea. While some people moved to these tracts of land allegedly set aside for them permanently, many others, like my own family, knew nothing of the treaties at all or chose to not leave the lands to which they had responsibility. Although terms were agreed upon, the treaties were not ratified. Supported by legislation passed before California was even officially a state, like an act for the government and protection of Indians, whose tenant stated, quote, in no case could a white man be convicted of any offense upon the testimony of an Indian or Indians, end quote. And naming white settlers' ability to, quote, obtain Indian children for indenture, end quote. This law also outlawed our land management practices, like the use of cultural burning, and made being present in our homelands an act of vagrancy. Due to a congressional gag order, the unratified treaties remain unknown to the public until 1905. My grandmother Luisa was born in 1837 to Ke Alalao and Joaquin Armas, a daughter of a brief but tumultuous marriage. The location of parcels awarded to her father by Kamehameha III and Kohala his unpopular appointment as Konohiki for the Ahapua'a of Muananui after the relocation of the royal seat to Hawaii and acreage in Waikapu threads some connection to prominent families while the swift relinquishment of most lands and abandoned land claims awards circa 1848 speaks to a fracture. The presence of Joaquin's name on a list of passport recipients for California in 1848 uh, coincides with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and tr the transitions of conflicting colonial governance. In 1815, Wa Joaquin Armas passed away living Nitz Puawas was Katichu Tichu Wa Amamutsun Katichu Tichu at Rancho Trinidad. Though her father left this world relatively penniless, it is told in our family that as his sole heir, Luisa came into a sum of close to $100,000 in the 1850s, with $75,000 worth of unpaid labor still requested from Kamehameha III listed in his last will and testament. This could also be read as continued contact or relationship with her mother's family in Hawaii. In 1886, Luisa began navigating the bureaucracy of the general land office as a recent widow. Various cash sale entries throughout the region demonstrated dedication with which Luisa worked to make payment for the wrongs that had been done to her own people on the islands and those of the coasts and hillsides of the family she came to call her relatives recognizing matrifocal and matrilineal responsibilities with each purchase. Like other native peoples, my family bent the intentions of the allotment era to respond to a disordered world, marking connection in a chain of systems meant to isolate and individuate. 
Of the roughly 3,000 acres scattered throughout San Luis Obispo County purchased between 1886 and 1914, a majority of the patchwork bearing Murillo or Garcia names are sprinkled along a meandering stretch of the Nascimento River near a village called Sitlacaya. Since bisected by the Nascimento Dam, some of these places rest underwater while others are prevented from visit by the borders of Camp Roberts or private housing developments seized through eminent domain. Understanding the power of paper and settler cosmologies, she used their tools to articulate our design, weaving consistent connection in the dotted patterns of parcels that echo the intermittent use of color in coiled baskets or a string of shells. Spanning oceans on running boards, skirt hiked to shine marvelous legs back up to the sun, still traveling, a pretty length of shells, some pitch, marbled lupin, and sky. Tapismo, pitch, tar, brea. Petroleum, survey, mineral, time. As documentation of minerals, uh, springs of mineral tar within reports commissioned by United States government predate or coincide with the Senate authorization and subsequent refusal to ratify the 18 treaties negotiated with California tribes, collusion between federal and state government of California is not only plausible but too timely to be coincidence. An examination of mineral and other natural resources Throughout the recently articulated boundaries of the state as requested by California Senate and Assembly was commissioned only 10 months after the denial and gag order of the unratified treaties in California. Like maps of the Monterey Shale Formation, documentation of various mineral resources trace a similar outline to the absence of tribal lands throughout the state. Echoing the traditional land bases of many California indigenous communities unrecognized by federal agencies as tribal nations. Combined with the dispossession of indigenous lands through continued legislation, this illustrates a cartography of collusion between our occupying governments. By 1893, over 24 million barrels of oil were being extracted per year, making California the top producer of the area. By 1981, there were over 5,500 miles of active, active pipelines within the state transporting petroleum. By 2012, Chevron, formerly Standard Oil, was noted as being engaged in 17 active pipeline or petroleum processing site cleanups, needs Butilhin Katichu alone, due to non-compliance with policy. In 2018, the Trump administration attempted new drilling near Shilkukanuts and pl shared places of power within the boundary of Carrizo Plain National Monument and overlapping with the land base allegedly set aside for our people by unratified Treaty C. In 2019, many of my family's former parcels and villages were included in the over 40,000 acres of federal lands proposed to open for hydraulic fracturing, fracturing throughout San Luis Obispo County. The waters we have followed since time immemorial, seemingly drained, collecting in stagnant pools with iridescent sheen, a thin film, a lens of ages. Tol, water. Transit, travel, trade. Of the many patents held by my relatives, significant parcels are held by women at the juncture of streams, mountains, or cultural confluences throughout the region and Chilpasini. These outline an ongoing moment of enclosure, but also significant capacity of simismo, uh, our word for a friend, which is derived from the word sima, which means to go with or to accompany in establishing and maintaining relationship to place, despite the marginalization of matrifocal governance and patterns of movement. California State Land Patent 18621 was processed at the San Francisco Office of the Bureau of Land Management, made out in the name of my grandmother, Leonora. It is through her that Cayucas, or Sithala, is repeated from generation to generation and passing mention or weighted vagueness, from Mary to Louise and Elvira, Lala to Cindy to me. Leonora's parcel sits between the location of Samimu near the spring of Toro Creek and Sithala near Cayucas, bisected by Via Creek and a clear view of Lisamu or Moral Rock. 
This intentional mapping of families and accompanying patterns of movement illustrate complex relationships with the land itself and with each other. In an embodiment of the shifting relationships and movement within the Central Coast, Leonora was born in 1858, somewhere in Santa Barbara County, to Yakti Chutichu, whose oscillating surname shifting from Arajo to Pico, depending on location, employer, or rancho. Leonora was married at Mission San Luis Obispo de Tolosa to Dionisio, Yaktichu with connections from Nitzpu Esselin Katichu to as far south as Huichime, Las Flores, near present-day Camp Pendleton in San Diego County. Their marriage reflects the long-established connections, um, constellations between indigenous peoples throughout the region, both quickened and inhibited by the colonial imposition of the mission system. These paths reflect responsibilities, often carried within families that changed form in the era of allotment, enclosure, and labor, paid marginally to cultivate an increasingly wealthless world. We worked the ranches that stole our villages out from under us, claiming imminent domain or abandonment, absent humanity or extinction. Restrained through linguistic as well as physical, spatial, and economic means, we continue to assert simismo, which, as a living intention and action, is always growing and changing. Long before such inequities, our movement followed and follows many patterns. Tilhini becomes San Luis Obispo, Sithala becomes Cayucas, Sithakoayu be reimagined as Cambria, following paths of seeds into sweat and soil and colored kerchiefs. Old Creek, which follows the northern parts of Santa Rita Road, named after a ranch that employed our relatives, is halted before the outflow to the sea to provide water for a seaside town, a university, and a prison, mirroring the enclosure and incarceration that made possible its making. What they did to the land, they did to each of us in turn. Our agency can be read into this stubborn movement refusing to be dispossessed or abandon our responsibilities to place. Not only did intercommunity or village marriages represent a long continuum of kinship networks throughout the region, so did travel across long distances to share ceremony, materials, food, and dances. In this sense, Leonora's own lineage, past into future, has this knowledge coded into it, marking specific points of relation within broad constellations of connection, patterns taught to her daughters and granddaughters well. It is no mistake that the place marked on a patent bearing Leonora's name is bisected by Via Creek and in the shadow of Cypress Mountain. The purchases of each described parcel made by Luisa coincide with the marriage of her youngest son, Jose Gregorio and Mary, the middle daughter of Dionisio and Leonora. Their union that would eventually result in 10 children, many of whom married into other prominent indigenous families throughout the central coast and valleys. The fact that each of the Garcia's parcels are in disparate parts of the county recognizes not only the current moment of their partnership, but also echoes the scope of relationships throughout our homelands and beyond. Without stories, documentation, whether from a land office, mission record, or anthropological perspective has little meaning. Our stories are expansive, in interpretation and in possibility, because we are speaking from a defined place, even when the language is changing. This means that we are as well. Our places, occupied by absence, are brimming. At the edges of the mythologies of the settled, are living in the forever of a dream that made this world and the next and the next, and the next. Needs butian and your his a shumokini, a seamless and ending hole. Ow, ow.
What can stories do in settled territories? Do they dress the pain of theft? Can a story heal a pueblo? But what if that story isn't real? And what if the real is unimaginable? Then don't that make the story true? What can stories do in settled territories? Settlement. To have gone into a village and bought the water, taken the land, created artificial fruit, dressed it with a sticker, and made all the children slowly disappear. What can stories do in settled territories? And what if those who have been dispossessed do not recognize the word settlement? And what if one day you are woken up and told that you are leaving? And what if that means permanently? So all of these poems are uh, written in dreams. Can you hear me? No? Is this better? Yeah? OK. Mi amor, you are going to have to learn how to run. Learn to run without shoes. Forget what it feels like to tie laces. Do not practice the ritual of a bow too many times. For you, you will forget that you are in danger. Corazoncito, when you get to the fence, you must run. You must not look back. You must run faster than ever. Pretend you are back in El Pueblo and you have just picked a bean of coffee from the no-heart men that enslaved our ancestors. Run as if they have seen you. Run to safety before they hunt you like a deer. Run before they lasso your body, traffic you to America, imprison you in detention, lynch you at the White House. Corre, 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 corre. Mijo, mijo, mijo. The life you must save is your own. You have thousands of hearts beating through your blood system. You may feel alone, but you are not. Deep inside your flesh, there are spirits of Zapotec and Angolan warriors. You will fight all the way. You will take in every ray of sunlight. You will take any bit of water offered, and you will always burst new roots, routes. You cannot be killed. Life is not only in your body, it is in your words, in your dreams, in your gestures, in your family, in your land. And this land will always be here for you, even if that means waiting. The land is patient. Abuelita, I'm so happy you answered your phone. I've been thinking a lot about how it's about you. How's everything in Morelos? Ay, mi hijo, pero qué gusto me da escuchar tu voz. Andas con tu mamá. No, abuela, estoy en mi apartamento. I wanted to call because I've been having dreams like never before. Anoche, un chambale azul llegó a mi sueño, and we walked to the stream where you taught me how to wash my clothes. Abuelita, the dragonfly there, the dragonfly took me there, and I could smell the coffee grinds being washed off the dirty clothes. I could taste the mole de iguana cooking a few houses away, and then something happened, abuela. I spoke to the water. The water speaks. Mi hijo, la cosa es que el agua siempre ha hablado. She appears in many forms. When my father died, it had been raining for 12 days. And I thought, I, and I thought maybe his death was an accident. And that night, the water came to me in a dream. 
She told me he was murdered, walked me to the killer's home. That morning, I rose at 3 a.m., made coffee and sat in my hammock. When the sun rose, I walked to the medicine woman's home, and when she saw me, she said, Te estado esperando, mi niña. She extended her hand, and when I grabbed it, she pulled me to her chest as she kissed me in my forehead and told me I was to live with her. My father had come to her in a dream and asked her to show me our people's way. She didn't speak our language, but she knew our way. In the evening, when the church bell rang, I saw men approach the house, two in the front, two in the back, and a mestizo in between them. Su casa ardió anoche y murió. One man spoke. The medicine, the medicine woman walked over to the mestizo and said, take us to his house, we shall bless him there. All of us walked in silence, one behind the other. When we finally got there, my sight slowly rose from the ground to the home. And as soon as I saw the home, I felt an incredible pain in my ear, moving all the way to my fingertips. It was the same home the water took me to see the night prior. His home went up in flames, and the first night the rain ended. I guess that's why she came to me, to comfort me in some way. That's when I realized, mijo, that we are children of the water. What did the water tell you, mijo? I, I think the younger version of me called her in. I asked her how I became a former brother. And she spoke in riddles, abuela. She kept repeating the color orange and orange and orange and orange. And I'm not really sure what that is. Mijo, orange is how we honor the dead. You were too little to remember anything, but you're still mourning. This is what you must do. You must tell your mother the dreams you've been having. But before you tell her, you must make sure you gather aguardiente, yerba buena, and candle wax. Once you have these ingredients, go to your mother. But mijo, before you hang up, I want to tell you something. I miss you. The land no longer looks like it did before you left. The Americans have finally come to the mountain. And they now own almost all the houses on the coast. The Europeans own the hostels. And the dragonflies have stopped coming. Something about the water. They can't seem to mature enough to rise to dry land, shed their skin, and release their wings. After the Americans and the Europeans came, the dragonfly stopped coming. The, drag the grasshoppers also left. And the white men started killing the iguanas in fear of their bodies and leaving the tender reptiles there to rot. When our people would find them, they'd bring them back to the village, clear their bodies, and offer them to the mountain. We couldn't eat them because we didn't ask the land for permission before they were hunted. We couldn't know what type of energy and spirits they carried, so we had to give them to the mountain. Sometimes when it rains, mijo, I think it is a mountain that is crying, not only for the land, but for all of you who had to leave. No one is returning. No one is coming back. Not the dragonflies, not the grasshoppers, not the iguanas, not the children. Are we ever going to see you again, mijo? Please come back. When a WhatsApp message appears, and the sender is not in your phone book, 
And what do you do when the message says your abuela has passed away and has already been buried? And what do you do when you don't know how to cry or ache or ache and then cry? And when will sitting in a dark bedroom with a laptop and Google Drive stop replacing bodies? And how do you deal with having been undocumented for 17 years and not have said goodbye? And why can't Google fucking have an answer, a diagnosis to why you do not feel the pain? And why is it that the first time you take an interest in Mezcal is three months after her death? when you Google best mezcal in San Francisco for under $50. It's funny how you think you can replace bodies with gastronomy. Mezcal doesn't resurrect. A body is not mezcal. A poem is not mezcal. Poetry plus a poem plus mezcal will never resurrect abuela. Funny how in this empire, liquor can travel, but the indigenous body cannot. At least distributors didn't forget the accent on Mexico's E, like I forgot all the memories of my fraternal abuela. I know all the excuses, but I refuse to give absent father, former father, the power to fade old childhood memories. I finally visited my pueblo and the abuela's home. Her mother is still alive with dementia. She remembered me after 18 years of absence. I finally visited my pueblo after reminding myself I was no ghost. It is difficult to believe you are a home when you've been displaced for so long. I finally visited my pueblo, saw photos of Ama, her Ama, and her abuela for the first time. These poems, these stories, are how I recuperate home. I finally visited my pueblo and made sure I brought it with me. There is an altar as proof. I finally visited my pueblo. There is an altar as proof. There is a poem as proof. Abuela. I was shown a photograph of your abuela. She carries a medicine pouch over her neck. Did you ever ask her what type of medicine she needed in order to survive occupation? Abuela, there is an altar in my room. Your abuela's photo rests on the wall above it. Have you spent time with your abuela while visiting me? Isn't it beautiful that the three of us can unite during Sunday evening ceremony? Abuela, there is an altar in my room, an offering to your abuela. Are you comfortable in our home? Is there anything that you need? Abuela, There is an altar in my room, an offering to your abuela. Are you comfortable in our home? Is there anything you can eat? Abuela, I may not have our language. I may not have our names. But I have you. I have your memory. Abuela. There's an altar in my room, an offering to your abuela. This is how the pueblo taught me to reassemble home. Abuela, there is an altar in my room. I am sorry I did not return. I am sorry I could not return. I am sorry that we had to leave. But thank you for coming to me in dreams. Thank you.
that's Kalawit. Thank you for being here tonight. A few years ago, uh, the Maori poet Robert Sullivan came to campus and gave a writing workshop. One of the things he did was to encourage the indigenous writers to use their indigenous aesthetics as the basis for their writing. And so, as terrifying as that was, I took up that challenge, and I'm going to read you two very short pieces that are part of a triptych um, called Feast. And the structure of these pieces is the Nez Perce Feast, in which, and I'll be reading the foods as they come out um, in the order that they're presented. Feast one. Kus. First taste of life, not air, but water, carried by our mothers. We taste water rising from earth, turning in salt waters where you, not Solch, travel through ocean waves and darkness, gaining power in those faraway salt currents of sea and labor to return again to the cold river of your origin, upriver to give life, where Wewukio bugle in fog-mantled mornings of our land awakening. We step toward Imes, each foot fall, a quiet petition. To be worthy of your gift, we bring you in, carry you, adorned in beadwork and beauty as drums beat through heart and women sing. Shlit an, songs return to earth, belong to the land, gathered by hand, thick bitter taste of green hills, chemas cradled in your hand, rooting you to this place. Songs flow from our throats of fine rain. The water cycle gives calls in spring, first feast of our green returning. Sun grows long branches, reach to sky. Hungry birds share Tim's offering, hard seeds to rule on our tongues with succulent sound of our nimipudimt. We sing Samit mountains in new dresses with baskets woven by grandmother's hands and songs we carry. We are carried to return again, give thanks again, return these songs, give breath and good words, ring, lift hands to sky, release heart thoughts. We are born in Kus. Feast two. <clears throat> Kus. I had a dream not long after I started. Some people say that when you start dreaming in a language, that's when you know it's become fluent to you. But I know this can't possibly be so. I think I maybe knew 20 or 30 words at the time, mostly nouns and greetings and a few verbs. But I had this dream, and it was beautiful. In the dream, I saw the longhouse at Nespilum. And on the side of the longhouse, I saw clearly this word, pine, arrival. I woke up just then, suddenly, and as I woke, I heard my own voice say, Paitsa, I'm coming, I'm arriving. The shock of hearing my voice impressed upon me the feeling of the dream. That dream helped me persevere when I felt small, when I was alone, when I looked at the enormity of it all. There were times I was discouraged when I faced the entire ocean of words and I feared the undertow would pull me under, like an eagle who's dragged into the current of a river, talons locked in the back of a salmon. Later, I would learn another word, and I would hold it just as close, say it to myself, to the sky, to Phil and those who spoke, Paitsa, Paitolkza, I'm coming, I'm coming back. Not so. He was from a salmon tribe over that way, over to the coast, and his tribe got terminated. I don't know why, but the folks around there stopped. Maybe it was a dark time for them, but they gave up the salmon ceremony, all of them, except this one guy. That's not something to do with just one person, but he did. Not even his family came. Some of his own people got on him, went hard on him for doing that. And maybe it wasn't right to do it that way, just he alone. I know that man. He's stubborn. He don't care. Eight, ten years like that, he kept it up all alone. After that, people start coming back. Now you go over there to salmon ceremony with them, and there's hundreds of people there. Not even all them know this story, but it's true. Wewukia. The animals help us. We know this from the old stories from when the world was coming to be, 
And the animal people offered themselves to us, each one in their way, each one in order. And still they offer themselves to us. A few years ago, I saw a photograph in a newspaper of a ship in the Pacific Ocean headed north. The ship was bearing the ancestors and belongings of the Haida Gwaii people. The ship was carrying them back home, bringing them home from a museum. So there was the ship headed north. And in front of the ship, leading the procession, was a bald eagle flying in the sky. And swimming alongside the ship, cresting with the waves, was a pod of killer whales. They traveled that way all along the Pacific coast, all the way home. The animals help us. We know this from the old stories, from the family stories, from court stories. I know a story that's happening right now about a man who ca called to an elk to help him, and the elk came to his aid, and now the man is in court. But listen, it's a good story. You see, the man is Sinecht from north of here. Many years ago, the Sinecht people were suffering from smallpox. They were weakened, and the Canadian min miners and settlers hunted those people down, drove them out of their homeland. The survivors came to us for refuge. We took them in, and now they're strong again. Here we call them the Lakes people, but they never stopped wanting to go back, or going back, in fact, to visit their homelands and hunt. Canada, in the meantime, decided the Sinecht were extinct and extinguished their rights. But the Sinecht people are still alive, and so are their rights. A few years ago, one of those unextinct Sinecht men killed an elk in his homelands. Then he called the game officials in Canada and turned himself in. They took the bait. When the province pressed charges against him for taking big game without a license, he pleaded not guilty. He cited his aboriginal rights to hunt in his own territory. And now that case is in court, and Canada will have to look at that man standing in the middle of the room and all his people around him, and Canada will have to admit that the Senecht are not extinct. The Senecht man is very brave, and so is the elk who gave himself. That man and the elk knew each other from long ago. They met in dreams and sweat, blood and forest. The man needed the elk. The people need the elk. Without the elk, there would be no case, no path home, no court for the man to present himself to the state and say, we are alive. Imes. From the Colville Confederated Tribes TANF uh, survey, what are the responsibilities of a father? What are the responsibilities of an uncle? Should a deer be considered acceptable payment in lieu of cash? Shrit An. And this one, you need to remember this. This root is good for nurse and mothers. Chemis. After World War II, advances in astrophysics allowed humans to see their planet from space. In 1972, the Apollo 17 took the most famous photograph of Earth, the blue planet. It might be fair to say that since the mid-20th century, humans have seen things that were never within their visual grasp before. But do we have better dreams? Have we seen better things? I think I would give up my fridge magnet of planet Earth, every glimpse of snowy mountain folds from the window of a plane, the glittering view of Paris from the Eiffel Tower on New Year's Eve. I would give up all those things to see what our ancestors saw, to dream their vivid dreams, to come over a mountain with my mothers and sisters and suddenly see in the wide open an enormous blue meadow of blooming camas, an endless unbroken field of periwinkle lake of lapis that today you could barely imagine, a land breathing and rolling with blue, a land so beautiful that you would wonder how to find your voice, find your offering, draw out a song on your breath and press the strength of your body to the earth, into the earth, into the deep wild blue. Tim's. We'd been camping for several days, and then we packed up to go home. It was August, hot, and we were going down a dry, dusty mountain road when we saw these big bushes loaded with choke cherries right beside a little steam stream. 
We stopped there and picked until we filled two big buckets, which took a long time, and I have to admit, we were not the most agreeable children at that time. We were tired and sweaty and wanted to go home, but my parents simply could not drive past those trees aflame with ripeness. We picked, we complained, we spit out the bright red ones, too bitter to eat raw, but filled with pectin and good to keep. Our parents did not scold us. The next day, my mother and I cooked the fruit down, strained it through cheesecloth, and made jelly. We poured the jelly into a mis mismatched collection of jars and small glasses and sealed them with paraffin wax. We laughed at how long it took to pick those buckets and how much fruit it took to make each little jar, which, when held to the light of the late afternoon sun, cast a rosy glow on the kitchen table. Sumit. Coyote carried on his back five agate knives of pure fir pitch and flint for making a fire. After some time, he made the grasses sway, and again, Coyote shouted at the monster, it's wetsick, let's inhale each other. At that point, monster suddenly saw the grasses moving, and he said, now then, you little Nisawelu, you first inhale me. Then Coyote tried, and he made monster stagger a little bit. Coyote said to him, now me you inhale, now that everyone, all the titokana you have eaten, take me too, lest I become lonely. Thus he insisted, and now the monster inhaled him. Just that way, monster took Coyote in, and as he went flying through the air, Coyote placed each one along the way, the titilu roots, and the titilo huckleberries, and the titilo service berries, saying, here the Indian people will find them, and they will be happy. Only a short time away, the human beings are coming. Rain came in abundance after years of drought in California, and we had no desire to complain about the gift of water. We wore our boots and beaded medicine bags and assembled on the steps, held our soggy banners aloft. Some of us had been to the camp, some not. We each did what we could. I marched with thousands in DC, also in the rain, and later sent money and supplies. I followed the stories of tribal delegations and ordinary activists to Standing Rock. Protests in Spokane, Seattle, the Capitol. We shouted. We marched, we wrote, we prayed, we drummed and sang and rang bells. We lifted our hands with eagle feathers and banners and holy anger, the anger of Jesus storming the temple, the holy fire of Chief Joseph, Sitting Bull, Martin Luther King. I saw my kin lead against the bitter wind with hand-lettered signs that said, Kus he was wakis, water is life, water is alive. All life begins and ends with water, our mothers, the rivers, the rain. From the beginning of time to the end of time, the word we carry on our breath, the taste of this world on our tongues and our tears is alive, is life, is kus. Thank you.